Yeah, I'm ready. Welcome, everybody, to our weekly Cyber Policy Center workshop. We are thrilled to have one of our own uh, give the talk this week, uh, Rishi uh, Bomasani, who is the society lead for the Center for Foundation Models uh, here, but is uh, active in all things AI related here at Stanford. Um, it's one of the great joys teaching here that you can learn so much from uh, graduate students. Uh, Rishi has already become, I think, really one of the uh, most knowledgeable people in the world on the topic that we're going to be talking about today, which is policy uh, for foundation models. Uh, he graduated uh, Cornell is in his fourth year here in the PhD program in computer science, but has already uh, really made quite a mark uh, in, in, the, uh, in academia and in the policy world on policies related to AI. So please join me in welcoming Rishi Bomsan. Uh, great. Uh, very excited to be here, and thanks, Nate, for the introduction. So I'll be talking about uh, a few different lines of work that are sort of united by the focus on foundation models, in particular, uh, how they connect to policy. So for those not familiar, when I talk about foundation models, I'm talking about this paradigm shift we have seen in the last three to four years in AI, where in particular, we're building these very resource-intensive systems that can be, then be used for a wide range of downstream applications. Right? So when I talk about resources here, I mean principally both in terms of the data and the compute. So these are very uh, you know, uh, scale-intensive systems. Uh, and they can be used for an unprecedented range of applications from what we've seen previously in AI. And this is a paradigm shift because previously in AI, what we saw is that for each application, we had to build a bespoke model, whereas now we can use a more general purpose model that can be applied and adapted to these different applications. So actually, a few years ago, we wrote this report with uh, a number of colleagues across uh, the university coining the term and really trying to characterize uh, this uh, sort of new concept and new approach to AI we were seeing uh, that built on, on prior efforts in deep learning and transfer learning in uh, AI, but also presented new sort of societal impact or societal implications. And so in particular in that report, one thing we thought was important is to really bring in our colleagues from outside of computer science uh, and really expand how we reasoned about AI because its impact was increasing uh, pretty rapidly. And I think uh, today I don't need to belabor that point. So with that in mind, I want to highlight a few key trends that I think are useful for contextualizing this because we come from a variety of different backgrounds. So the first is the point on resources. So this is the amount of... Uh, data, compute, and ultimately money and capital going into building these uh, models, right? And so actually from uh, Stanford's AI index, uh, they document as of last year, or actually even two years ago, models cost on the orders of tens of millions of dollars. In 2023, that went up another order of magnitude. Maybe in 2024, it'll go up by yet another into the hundreds of millions, into billions uh, for building a single model. As a consequence of that resource investment, we've seen uh, this diversification in terms of the applications and uses of AI, right? And so this also now spans a range of modalities. I think a lot of the time the attention is on language and text, but really I think we're going to increasingly see applications in other uh, modalities as well. Perhaps the most salient point is that now we're talking about AI being widely adopted uh, in society and not just sort of a research endeavor, right? And we can see this in a variety of ways. Uh, I think the display went away on my end. Like not, nothing shows up here. Um, Right, so, so AI is widely adopted, as we see with ChatGPT. <laughs> um, and then as a sort of prediction of where things are heading, we're seeing even more investment into startups and into established companies in this space. Um, OK, sounds good. Great. Um, uh, yeah. Let me just try to see. So my work addresses a few different things, but for the purpose of this talk, I, th I thought I'd organize it into these three sort of categories. Uh, 
So in particular, my work tries to establish sort of a baseline level of understanding and transparency of what is going on. On that basis, then I try to introduce some new concepts I think are important for uh, reasoning about this new technology. And then ultimately, and as is mainly the focus of this talk, I think about how we can improve the status quo in society, including through policy. So on the first front, I'll talk about our work on transparency, in particular one line of work on the transparency index. Um, in many ways, this is motivated by a lot of the work that has already happened in social media transparency, including by people here. And so I'll talk about that analogy in particular. So this is a collaboration with uh, a few different folks from here and also from Princeton and MIT. And in particular, the stage setting uh, to think about here is the level of opacity we see in the foundation model ecosystem today. So by that, I've taken this snippet here from the GPT-4 technical report to instantiate it. And what you can see, uh, if you can see the slide, is that uh, you know, OpenAI discloses very little, if anything, about uh, how they build GPT-4 or its capabilities or other such things, right? And this is not just an indictment of OpenAI. This is more generally uh, what we see uh, across the landscape from a number of other uh, major labs in this space. And this is not uh, the first time we've seen this for digital technology. In fact, it's a maybe overwhelming trend we see with many digital technologies, right? So we can think about uh, social media, where we have seen these problems about uh, transparency in relation to data. We can think about crowd working and crowdsourcing, where we've seen this in relation to labor practices. Uh, we can see this in, in other parts of social media and other technologies in terms of dark patterns. And so this trend of opacity uh, in widely used and highly consequential digital technologies is not new and is something that we're going to try to countervail in this work. So how will we try to do that, right? So the status quo, to think about it, is that many of these leading uh, AI developers are opaque in different ways. And so the first question is, how opaque are they or how transparent are they? And can we characterize that? And second, how do we change things moving forward? And so here, we'll pick up an idea uh, called the composite index that's been used in a variety of the social sciences, right? And you've probably seen this in different ways. So for example, we have composite indices like the Human Development Index that rate countries uh, for human development, uh, and also indices that rate companies like the Corporate Accountability Index. And these indices have been used to both assess the status quo in different areas, but also to drive change. That is, they are uh, instruments that are powerful enough in some cases to move uh, fairly uh, powerful actors and institutions. So by that analogy, what I'll do is first introduce how we design the transparency index. So the idea here is how should we measure uh, transparency for foundation models. And in particular, part of the point here is going to be that transparency is this buzzword that uh, people love to throw around, but how can we be more precise about what we mean? So we'll take the construct of transparency and sort of hierarchically decompose it uh, into sort of constituents. So uh, first, we'll decompose it into these three domains. So you can be transparent about the resources going into building a foundation model. I'll call that upstream resources. The model itself, so for example, its capabilities, limitations, risks, et cetera. And then it's sort of downstream use and impact across the wider economy. Right? And for each of those, we'll further decompose them. So for example, in the upstream category, there is uh, data, labor, compute, and others. And still further, we'll decompose those into ultimately uh, the unit of analysis here will be these 100 indicators. So these are uh, specific matters that companies could or could not disclose about their foundation models across uh, these different aspects of the sort of supply chain. Right? And so here I've enumerated all of these 100 indicators. I'm happy to talk about them. For the purpose of the talk, I'll keep things fairly high level, but happy to dive deeper at any point if there are questions. So the first thing is once we define these 100 indicators, how do all of the different organizations fare? Right? So what we're going to do is look at 10 major uh, foundation model developers, at least uh, as of October 2023, and assess them against these 100 indicators. So do they disclose the information uh, relevant for each of these? Right. And so what we find uh, from doing that sort of uh, analysis at the top level is that uh, you know, companies do disclose some of this information, but also don't disclose much of it. Right? So the most transparent companies, at least uh, according to our assessment, um, still are only disclosing about half of these 100 indicators. Right? And then the next question is, first, why is there this big disparity between, say, uh, Meta and Amazon of almost 40 uh, points here? 
And more importantly, where do we see sort of systemic opacity in this space versus more idiosyncratic opacity? <laughs> Right, so for the first version of the index, we went for a simplicity with binary. I think the next goal, and I'll talk about it later, is to do something more fine-grained, but yeah. So, you know, again, because we're, we're talking about disclosing a variety of different information, I'm just going to present some sort of aggregate trends. Again, ask me if you want more specifics. Uh, so we'll look at these sort of uh, 13 or uh, uh, subdomains. So each row here has sort of been aggregated up across a few different indicators on a that share a topic in common, like labor, let's say. And what we see is that there is some sort of uh, structure in, in how companies are disclosing and not disclosing information. Right? So for example, on the topic of labor, we see that companies are fairly systemically opaque. Right? This is not necessarily a trend about any specific company. It's a more general trend across uh, all of these companies. Right? Similarly, in terms of thinking about the downstream impact towards the bottom of this figure uh, and the downstream use of these models, there's fairly little uh, transparency as well, right? I think this is important because this is a technology that is a sort of general purpose technology that can be used in a variety of different ways. And so how we reason about it is sort of contingent on our understanding of where it is in practice being used. And the reality is we actually have a fairly poor understanding of where uh, these models are being used in practice across which sectors and which use cases. On other topics, there is more sort of uh, variation. So for example, on data or on uh, compute, we see that some companies provide information where others don't, right? And so there's also uh, potential here for us to at least try to push towards uh, each company meeting its competitors' practices, right? And by making clear where each of these 10 companies stand and, and in future iterations where even more companies stand, there's this potential to try to raise the bar at least to what is already being done by some company. So an interesting stat there is that of the 100 indicators, 82 of them are at least satisfied by some company in our assessment, right? So even though the highest scoring companies are around a 50, there's this pretty significant margin even for them and for everyone uh, to move up to at least that 82. So what I want to really think about, especially for this audience, is the theory of change here and not just this sort of uh, static assessment, right? So how do we use this uh, work and other works that I'll talk about to actually drive change here, right? So one part of it is going to be how do we work with the companies themselves to get them to disclose more information. But the other is how do we uh, provide pressure, whether through the media or through uh, governments, in designing policy and deciding uh, sort of greater awareness for this, uh, and, and how does that come to be? So one of the things to Jeff's question, uh, or, or sort of building on it, is uh, where will we see this going uh, next? And so one of the key ideas that we take, again, from the composite indices we've seen elsewhere in the world is this idea that by repeating the index, uh, you sort of first can track what changes, but also you can change certain design decisions to try and move the needle uh, incrementally. Right? So one of the ideas we had here is in the very first index, one detail I sort of swept under the rug is how we specifically did the assessment. So in the first version, we went out and looked for all of this information ourselves in a somewhat systematic way. But now what we're going to try to do, in part building on the ideas of transparency reporting we've seen in social media, is to get the companies to more proactively disclose this information in a systematic way, right? Um, because I think just disclosing the information is one piece, but having it be in a place where different stakeholders can identify it is yet another piece that is necessary for this information to be useful. So that's one of the steps we're taking. And so right now, uh, we've gotten roughly 10 of these companies to agree to start producing this kind of uh, uh, reports. And so in April, we'll conduct the next iteration based on these reports that they'll now produce. Another piece is you know, we can see what mileage we can get from the companies themselves taking action, but that's you know, unlikely to be enough. And so how do we uh, you know, introduce other uh, mechanisms? In? So one is that we've tried to work pretty closely with the media to try to cover this work, and in particular, try to build a you know, sort of greater awareness and accountability in the space uh, through that mechanism. And towards the end of the talk, I'll also talk about the policy piece as well. So this is sort of the end of the first part of the talk. I'll take any questions right now if there are any. Um, uh, 
And then I'll sort of switch over to the topic of open models. So to sort of segue between them, uh, one thing I want to highlight here is one thing we find in this work is we assess 10 companies. Three of them, so Meta, Stability, and Hugging Face, release their models openly. The other seven do not. Um, and what we see is that there's a pretty clear empirical disparity between the amount of openness from the, uh, sorry, sorry, the amount of transparency from the open actors versus the more closed actors. And this will come up in the second portion. So any questions on this first part on transparency? Go, go, or do you want me to keep going? Right through, and then we'll okay. go to the end. Or Daphne, I, I can take you the question. Could you have a real question? Okay. Uh, so I'm going to ask the, uh, I'm going to ask the, the requisite what you measure is what you get question. Mm -hmm. Like, um, are there things, if you look at what you're measuring here, are there things that you are aware that you're missing or that you, know, that you worry can't be captured by the kinds of metrics you've defined? Yeah, I think there, the missingness part, I think there's definitely some stuff that's missing where we sort of deliberately excluded it uh, just for the first version. I think in part this was our sort of you know, strategic choice of um, not, I think we were trying to get some amount of transparency across the board rather than specifically pushing on areas where we thought uh, uh, there needed to be more pushing. Um, so I think that's maybe the most salient part of what's missing. So for example, I think there are some specific concerns on labor where we sort of still kept it fairly superficial for this iteration. Um, and the second point is, I think we did have this concern of you know, where we set these bars right now, we don't want to ossify there and that be to be the you know, forever standard of uh, transparency. And so I think our solution there is to sort of just iteratively update the index and the, the sort of threshold we set over time. So the second piece I'll talk about is this topic that has garnered a lot of attention in the broader discourse, which is this idea of open models and closed models and, and, and what's going on in this space. So we've done a number of works on this, but I'm going to talk two, about two in particular. One is a sort of policy brief uh, with Maricha and other colleagues here. And then another is this broader work we're doing with a range of different uh, colleagues from a variety of institutions uh, depicted there. So they both shared the kind of theme of we want to understand what we mean by openness, and more importantly, how that uh, sort of uh, shapes or contours our understanding of the societal impact of these models. So to be precise, because the term open is used in a variety of ways, often you know, generally imprecisely, what I'll mean very particularly is this distinction between whether a model is released with its weights, so the underlying parameters made available broadly, or not. So this distinction also carries through to how um, in the executive order out of the US, we've recently seen this distinction of whether models are released with widely available weights or not. So that's the distinction between open and closed that I'm talking about here. So to, to ground that, uh, there are many examples of open models uh, and also many examples of closed models. So on the closed side, I'll just take GPT-4 as a sort of uh, familiar example. And on the open side, there's a variety uh, from a range of different organizations. I think this is often sort of uh, forgotten about uh, is that Many of these organizations in the past were releasing models openly, but that has changed to now a fairly uh, smaller set today are releasing these models openly. And again, as I mentioned, you know, this is not just a topic that we're you know, thinking about, but has really kind of garnered a much wider range of uh, kind of consideration in terms of the political economy and the space about uh, where things are headed. So, to reason about this, first I want to identify five key properties of open models that then will inform both our analysis of their benefits and risks. So the first, uh, and sort of almost by definition, uh, property I'll identify is that we'll say a model you know, is open if its weights are broadly accessible. And you know, uh, this entails the fact that you know, a variety of people can use it. Of course, the model developer can try to impose some restrictions on who cannot use it but it's very difficult to, to uh, sort of enforce these once the model is made uh, broadly available. The second is about the degree to which they can be customized. So by releasing the weights, as opposed to just allowing you to query the model as a black box like you would a search engine, you can customize the model to a far greater extent. And this is going to be useful for both uh, sort of its benefits, but also its kind of misuse potential. The third is because the model is openly available and you have the weights, you can use them uh, as you wish on computing resources of your choice. Right? So for example, you're no longer bound to say, uh, provide OpenAI your data and have them run inference on the model because you have the weights, you can do that yourself. The fourth is because 
uh, the models are you know, openly released, uh, there are going to be two issues. One is uh, it's hard to rescind access to people that already have the model. And second, sort of relatedly, it's hard to monitor or moderate their usage of the model, right? Because uh, the weights are available. You know, again, you can try to impose restrictions through a license or other means, but it's hard to at least uh, functionally guarantee that these things will be upheld. So what is the point of defining these five sort of uh, you know, properties? Well, one reason we want to do this is think about which of these influence certain benefits and certain risks that are discussed in the, in the discourse. So on the left are these five properties, um, again. And what I'll first do is talk about how they inform many of the benefits that have been proposed or described. So the first is this kind of benefit of determining who uh, dictates what is acceptable behavior or acceptable, acceptable speech from uh, these models, right? So in particular, uh, a model developer might have some sort of policy of what they uh, deem as acceptable behavior from their model, uh, but because the model is released openly, um, others, so other users or other uh, downstream, can sort of change that policy uh, and therefore specify what it is they uh, sort of deem as acceptable, right? And so this creates a bit of a distribution of who is able to uh, sort of determine what is acceptable and not uh, in terms of model behavior. A second benefit is sort of in terms of the extent to which these models are able to contribute to innovation, right? And in particular, there are going to be a variety of factors that play into this, but perhaps most saliently, the fact that you can customize the models more aggressively allows for a greater uh, sort of innovation and greater specialization of these models to different downstream applications. Also, the fact that you can perform local inference sort of uh, you know, obviates certain concerns of, of um, you know, privacy and so on and, and, and uh, data uh, sharing. The third is sort of related to the topic of innovation in some ways as a sort of uh, you know, special case of it, of thinking about scientific research. And in particular here, many of the same uh, benefits are useful. One of the sort of interesting things is from a scientific perspective, one challenge with some of these closed models is that they can change, right? So for example, OpenAI can put something behind the GPT-4 API or any of the other sort of more closed providers. Because you're unable to rescind access, in some ways you always have access to the weights and so there's a sort of side effect of sort of improved reproducibility because the weights are sort of persistent in this regard. And then finally, in terms of transparency, uh, because there is broader access, there are some benefits to transparency. On the other hand, uh, you know, thinking about the first part of this talk, uh, these benefits are not necessarily guaranteed. So just because you release the model weights openly doesn't imply that you'll be more transparent about the data, the labor, the compute, any of the downstream use. Of course, what we found is these empirically correlate, but there's no uh, guarantee uh, from, from releasing a model openly that things will be more transparent in these you know, broader forms. But simply because... Uh, you know, there's broader access, there's maybe some forms of transparency that are sort of guaranteed. So that's the benefit side. Now, I think one of the central reasons that the question of openness has come to be a topic of broad debate and discourse is in particular because of the risks uh, that have been argued for, and in particular, the risks of misuse of these models, right? So the basic idea is, you know, because, you know, ostensibly anyone has access to these models and they're fairly powerful, one could imagine that they could uh, sort of facilitate a, ver a variety of different forms of misuse. In fact, all five of these distinctive properties in some way feed into uh, these different concerns about misuse. And in particular, uh, what we did is we sort of surveyed the literature of the range of different concerns that have been uh, provided uh, or sort of described in terms of the misuse potential. And I think what's important here to recognize is that these are very varied in nature. Um, Right, so there are some concerns that are about kind of more well-demonstrated harms like of CSAM and NCII. Uh, there are others that are kind of more speculative about cybersecurity and biosecurity. And they also vary in terms of the policy solutions and how we reason about uh, these different harms and sort of the nature of these threats. So again, if there are any questions about the specifics, happy to talk about them, but I'm sort of glossing over them for the sake of time. And so what we do in this work, uh, and I won't have time to go into it too deeply, is we try to make this uh, sort of discourse more precise, right? So these you know, broad risk categories have been sort of proposed in relation to open models. What we want to do is really hone in on what is the marginal risk of this new technology, right? So for example, you might have this concern that you can use uh, you know, 
Llama 2 or some open model to get information about how to generate a bomb. But of course, then the question is whether that information was already publicly available or easily accessible or not. Right? And so one thing we want to understand is really what is the marginal risk, not just you know, what is uh, you know, this kind of uh, un, you know, underspecified potential for harm. And in particular, to do that, we'll take this idea from cybersecurity of how to reason about the marginal risk, so sort of specifying uh, a clear threat model, trying to understand what are the current attacks and defenses that exist, and ultimately, given all of that sort of baselining, what is the new sort of marginal capabilities, and how can we respond uh, to those new sort of marginal threats? And in particular, one of the key ideas here is going to be that many of these aspects of the analysis are not going to be static. Right? In the sense that as the models become more capable, as society evolves in a variety of ways, much of the marginal risk will change. Right? So in particular, you know, you know, in 2019, we worried about disinformation from GPT-2. Of course, maybe that didn't pan out. But as the models become more capable, that certainly influences the analysis. Right? So I think that is one of the things we want to think about is what are the assumptions here uh, and make those uh, overt rather than tacit. So one of the things we did is we sort of surveyed work in across all these seven different uh, threat vectors and tried to assess how well it does at sort of you know, satisfying our framework of how to reason about the marginal risk. And one of the points we want to make here is not necessarily that this prior work is flawed, but it certainly does not, in many cases, provide sufficient evidence to make the claim that there is marginal risk posed uh, by these open models, or by closed models, for that matter. Right? And so one of the things we want to really make clear especially as we're trying to reason about policy, is where do we have clear evidence of you know, increased marginal risk, and where do we not, and how does it inform our sort of decision making on the policy side? And so with that, um, you know, this sort of is the second part of the talk, and I'll again highlight uh, sort of the connection into policy here. So under the executive order um, from uh, uh, this past fall, uh, we saw in section 4.6 a focus on, in particular, models with widely available weights, so, so open models as I've been describing them. Similarly, in the recently negotiated AI Act, we see a sort of partial exemption for open models. Right? And so, not just in these two jurisdictions, but in others, the question of how we should treat open models and in what ways uh, they're different or in what ways um, sort of the analysis should be about open versus closed rather than all foundation models together is increasingly an important question. So to wrap up, um, I'll quickly talk about some of our work on the policy front. And probably this is maybe more interesting just to have uh, questions about. So uh, feel free to press me on any part of it. So we've made a variety of different uh, sort of call, uh, contributions in the policy space uh, that sort of can be looked at in terms of sort of four key ideas. So sometimes our work is trying to directly motivate or inspire uh, the design of policy. So for example, Shortly after putting out the Foundation Model Transparency Index, we saw uptake of it uh, from a senator, uh, sorry, representatives uh, Bayer and Eshoo, who proposed this uh, Foundation Model Transparency Act to try to make things more transparent. In fact, there's pretty good alignment with the index on, on some of the specifics here. And, and sort of, you know, this is a snapshot of it. So we actually look at a variety of different policies, including um, uh, their uh, proposed bill, which is the sort of third column in this. Uh, a set of six, and what you see is that there's some, some reasonable alignment with the 100 indicators. So I've just looked at maybe 10 or so of the indicators, but um, yeah, there's alignment with some of the others as well. Another case is where we try to shape ongoing policy. Um, and so with Maricha and with other colleagues at High, uh, we looked at you know, how we can sort of inform uh, the AI Act uh, negotiations uh, during much of the end of last year. Uh, and you know, I think one of the things we did fairly successfully is really push uh, the sort of conceptualization of, of foundation models and the supply chain, and ultimately this emphasis on transparency and many of the substantive requirements uh, in, in that part of the act. A third sort of category of our work is trying to analyze policies that have already been proposed or already been uh, put into force. So we've done this with both the executive order and sort of earlier versions of the AI Act. And sort of the fourth category is we try to codify certain things that are described in the policy world imprecisely and make them more specific. So one work that will come out soon is our work on transparency reports, again, motivated by some of the work that has happened in uh, social media, uh, building on this sort of um, uh, vague 
description of transparency reporting that appears in the White House's voluntary commitments and also in the uh, G7's code of conduct. And we've done some other work in the space, but maybe I'll just end there and wrap up for questions. Well, that was wonderful. Those of you online uh, can put your uh, questions in the Q&A function in Zoom, and then it will magically appear on my phone here. Uh, let me let me start by being needlessly provocative here, and and. Um, so Mark Zuckerberg last week said the goal now uh, for their generative AI work is to make develop open source uh, uh, general uh, you know uh, artificial general intelligence. Um, you're I, I'm going to ascribe this to you, that, uh, you know, and and of course the Center for for Foundation Models uh, folks here definitely is sort of more pro openness right in in the development of models when you hear something like that do, do you have concerns i mean does that is that the kind of thing that um, where you say well you know we should slow this down we should be um, uh, you know how, how should we think about this yeah, yeah. great so very provocative um, <laughs> uh, but I think it's it's a key question. So I think we're supportive of openness uh, in part for, for today's models and in part, I think what we are supportive of is having open models that are, are competitive or strong on the market. Um, I think today that, that is maybe leading to better outcomes, but I think the evidence on any side of the coin is is very uh, you know underdeveloped at this moment to, to make that analysis very sharply. But I think that's just a sort of uh, inherited commitment from our traditions of open science and other types of openness that are not the same, but sort of share an ethos. Um, I think to, to Mark's, uh, you know, uh, comments on open AGI or something that he said like this, um, I think my concern is not necessarily about the open part or not, but more so about the, the AGI part or not, um, in the sense that I think what we, we should really be trying to focus on is finding applications where there's actual value from this you know, latent set of capabilities we have or, or an all increasingly realized set of capabilities. Um, I think we've sort of made the discourse very centric on openness versus not, and indeed we also work on this topic. Uh, but I think sometimes it's a bit of a red herring to uh, figuring out the more substantive question of you know, who ultimately will have power here, whether you know, the model is open or not, you know, there's still, it's very capital intensive. And so it's not as if, Openness here means an absolute distribution of power or something. So I think, um, to me, that's the concern, is that we really have not clarified where this technology is beneficial. I do think there are benefits, but I think that is imprecise. And fixating on the openness or not, I think, is maybe the second order piece in my mind. Well, but, but part of this goes to whether how we should assess risks in a technology that's, uh, regarding a technology that's rapidly changing. And so, in part, you might think that the openness of the system and the degree you're going to democratize access to it is, you know, one more layer of concern, right? And and that, um, I mean, so so take something like the saw about bioweapons, right? I think you and I agree that this is, I think is, well, I don't I want to describe this to you. It's been a big distraction, right? That I think the hysteria over bioweapons um, um, related to these models, I think, is uh, misunderstanding again, like what type of information is already out there, but suppose I'm wrong, right? So suppose that, that the next generation of models will actually lead people to um, um, formulate bioweapons. If you've, the open source models, once they're out, right, you can't, you can't claw it back. Um, is, there, is that an argument for moving slowly here and the degree of openness that we would want from um, these new kinds of models? That, that it's just, there's just so much uncertainty. Yeah, I think it's an interesting question. So I think, first of all, the point is not to say that there will never be bioweapon risk or that we should dismiss the category, right? I think the point is just that the current evidence is poor, right? That doesn't mean it can't change and it sh we shouldn't do research on it, but I think that's the first point. I think the second point is that we have this interesting, you know, we were at a workshop recently, and I think someone made this point uh, um, that I'll, I'll sort of paraphrase. We have this interesting uh, sort of societal uh, arrangement at the moment where often the most capable models are first built in a closed fashion and then it's the open actors catching up. I think it's not clear to me that we need this, but it is an interesting sort of, uh, sort of implicit 
societal level staging, right? It's not necessarily that Meta or whoever is building the most capable open models is themselves doing stage releases, but implicitly, it's a certain societal level, again, glossing over many details. You know, open AI is sort of doing the staging for us, and then uh, you know, Meta is releasing a model that's less capable than open AI is a bit later, right? And so I think we are getting some of this testing, if you will. I think, to me, if we were trying to make a very sharp analysis, I think one of the things that's not yet clear is like how much margin you get uh, by having access to the weights versus just black box access, right? Because you know, the, the counterfactual here is not that nobody has access to yep, these very yep. capable models. Like, they're all, you know, if the critique is aimed at the open actors, I think we shouldn't forget that through these closed actors, we still have broad access to, you know, GPT-4 or whatever, right? So I think we just have to be careful about the counterfactual. And I think, that, I think that's important, that, and, and the kind of spectrum of openness that you talk about there, I think, is key. I want to make sure we, I think there are a lot of questions coming over Zoom. Uh, I want to make sure we, we open it up as soon as possible. So. Uh, are there questions from folks here? Let's go to Dave Wilner over here and then Samin Chakrabarty over there. Less a question and more a box of provocative thoughts. Um, I, I found the focus on proving the existence of risk sort of interesting coming from a risk management background in sort of large scale systems because we don't, that, that is not how we think about risk, right? In general, we, we sort of think more about whether or not a risk is going to be interesting to a large audience and possible, and then assume it is inevitable because it is possible and a bunch of people are eventually gonna try. It's sort of the law of large numbers. And at least what we've seen thus far with the misuse of models to me is very obviously following that sort of encountering the law of large numbers on the internet curve. So I, I hear you from like a solid science foundation point of view, but I don't know that it's the right approach for risk mitigation. Similarly, like in the context of open weights, yes, there are people inside companies that have open weights, but you can have access to those weights, but you can conceive of a method of monitoring that access in the same way we do around data privacy, whereas you cannot conceive of one in the context of open models other than like societal level computer surveillance, which sounds like a terrible idea. So there, I would just push a little on, are we trying to study whether harms are demonstrated or provide a framework for risk projection? Because if you're gonna mitigate risks, it's, a, it's actually a very different way of thinking about the question. Yeah, I, th I think both points are fair and, and, and well taken. Um, I think on the second one, I do think there is some work to be done, maybe not so much on the misuse side, but on, on the benefit side of just more kind of market level understanding of where these models are being uh, done. And I think the UK is doing some of this already, but I'd be happy to see more of that from other jurisdictions. Over here. Uh, I would plus one Dave's point, especially um, as somebody who spent a lot of time in hand-to-hand -hand combat with adversarial actors. <laughs> I have a, maybe a different default point for um, misuse risk. But my question actually is around the transparency index itself. Are there certain dimensions of transparency that you think may be um, counter to safety type goals? And if that's the case, how do you think about including them or not including them in the index? Because I could see an argument, if you did believe that that category exists, I could see not including it because you want the transparency index itself like higher to mean better or more good. Or I could see an argument for including it and just say this is like not a value to determination, it's just like absolute amount of transparency, but at least kind of force more transparency over those dimensions that might be risky. So how do you think about that? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think intrinsically at, at the sort of abstract value level, clearly transparency is at times intention with a variety of things, not just about safety, but privacy and other things. Um, I think our view is that where we put the, the word that we sort of put the lines in the sand for how much transparency is minimally necessary to award the point. I think we felt that these really don't get to the level where you see those tensions really play out in our judgment. Of course, people could disagree with that. Um, so that was one piece of thinking. And in part, it was because we wanted to, you know, I think sometimes there is the sort of uh, philosophical question of how much these are intention. Um, because I think broadly they're, they're often in times intention, but I think we were trying to sort of find the cases where we sort of set the bar low uh, to try to identify cases where they're not intention. So that was kind of the philosophical approach. Um, 
In terms of the positioning, I think our goal was to keep it as a, as a transparency and not a goodness index or like a, how desirable is this? Um, uh, in part, because I also think the, the goodness here is not equal in terms of good for which stakeholders. Um, I think some of this transparency is useful for specific stakeholders and some of it is useful contingent on a specific you know, model of the world or theory of change or so on, where a lot of that we don't know yet. So that, that's at least part of your question. One other thing I'll highlight is I think we wanted to put it out and then see where we got pushback from the industry. Uh, and in part, there were several cases where people were like, we're not transparent about this uh, because it introduces liability risk, mm -hmm. right? Which is another countervailing interest besides safety and, and privacy. Um, uh, or we are transparent about this to only our customers, again, to reduce liability risk or other, you know, other special cases of these things. So I think before doing the index, we had priors on where these kind of intricacies in the manifold are, but I think now we have a much sharper understanding of like what people are deliberately opaque about versus they hadn't considered being transparent about in the first place. Yeah, quick follow-up mm -hmm. on that. So if, if higher doesn't necessarily mean more good, mm -hmm. then how does that impact your theory of change of like trying to compel people to kind of get higher and higher scores? So let me just repeat the question. So the question is, um, if higher doesn't necessarily mean better, how does that fit in with the goal of trying to get people and models to compete for higher and higher transparency scores? Yeah, I think in part the, I think we definitely feel they're correlated. Like they're not uh, you know, orthogonal uh, in the sense that I think there are a few specific indicators where I am individually less opinionated on whether I think higher is clearly better. I think what I'm trying to at least get us to is uh, a state where if you're not disclosing information, the sort of justification for not disclosing it should be clear, right? And we can subscribe to different theories of change and so on, but I want it to first of all be a deliberate decision on the company's behalf of what they disclose or not rather than a sort of unclear decision from, from the external view. And uh, a case where the, the disclosure is a speech act in the sense that if you don't disclose it, uh, it, it's clear why you didn't do that and, and you've made that argumentation clear. Um, and then I think we can, we can still figure out you know, where we want to go after that. Can, can I just follow up a little bit on this uh, as you go, I think Florence Giselle is the next question. Um, what's your response to when the companies say, well, this introduced liability risk? I mean, what, how should we think about that? Because yeah, I mean, transparency always introduces some kind of legal risk because suppose, suppose through transparency you find out they're doing something wrong, right? And so like, how should we think about that? Yeah, I think, I think one of the interesting things there though is even, um, you know, it's first of all understanding the heterogeneity in the space, mm -hmm. right? In the sense that, uh, you know, all the companies are obviously averse to liability, but it seems like the response to that is quite heterogeneous in nature in terms of what some are disclosing, others are not, even if they have you know, certain high level abstraction, the same kinds of concerns. Um, so I think it's useful to understand that heterogeneity. I think this is also a case where I think we're willing to change the index if we feel like it's clear enough that this competing interest is, is legitimate uh, and figure out like where we can contour things a bit more. Right now, I think we came in, we had our own sort of conceptual model of like uh, what made sense in part by talking to many colleagues mostly outside of companies, in part to be uh, sort of independent. Uh, but I think as we gain more context, and certainly we, we, we know many of these companies quite well, I think that'll help us figure out what makes sense from a sort of societal perspective and not just from a company interest perspective. So what would, what would be like the most important piece of data? What would, if, you could, if you could have one part of that transparency index, would you want, I mean, would it be the training data? Is that the thing that would be the most important? Like, if you could actually get like one thing, you know, if you were king of AI. For for me, and I'm not saying that this is what's necessarily the most important, but for me, um, uh, I think it's really actually about the usage uh, and where these models are being used. I, I know a lot of attention gets focused on the training data, and, and you know, there are many reasons for that, whether it's about copyright or IP or bias or so on, and, and these are all very important. Um, but for me. I would still say that, to me, 
the thing that cripples almost every policy conversation we have is that we're always in this kind of like hypothetical regime of like, oh, the models could be used for a number of things, right? And that's, that's true, but they are used for some specific things today. Uh, and I would like to know those specific things so that we could have more informed policy discourse and not just this kind of, you know, we're considering a thousand different worlds when we actually only live in one. Well, I do wonder whether you would be able to get that kind of information from the open source models, right? I mean, because they don't, it's much harder to have visibility into how they're being used, but that, that makes, but makes a lot of sense, particularly for the closed source models that they might not know how it's being used. Florence Giselle. Hello, Rishi. Um, I have a question about the relationship between, um, on the one hand, experts like you, Policymakers, on the other hand, and the industry. Uh, I would just like to um, take one example. You, you followed the, uh, the drafting of the AI Act, and you know that a few countries before Christmas, right before the final uh, negotiation, um, a few countries, and my country first, uh, advocated for a so-called uh, mandatory self-regulation, and the idea that um, model cards would be uh, a sufficient standard for transparency. Uh, and as far as I know, even within the industry, this, these model cards are not considered as sufficient. Uh, so we know how it ended, but my impression is that policymakers and people that draft regulations are not always um, in the best place to decide on the appropriate standards and they are dependent on the industry. And th so I think there is a risk there because of course the industry has its own agenda and interests. And so I would like to hear you about this because um, I suppose that as an expert, you have a specific uh, place that you want to, to be in and uh, a specific vision about this. Yeah, I think it's a great question. So I think first maybe I'll just echo uh, our good friend uh, Dan Ho on saying that uh, mandatory self-regulation is a bit of an oxymoron, but um, nonetheless, that was uh, the thinking for a bit. I think on model cards, first of all, just to, to get to the narrow part and then go to the broad part, um, you know, one of the things is that model cards is basically, in my view, a meaningless term. Uh, it basically means you created a PDF, and what you put in the PDF is kind of fully at your discretion. I mean, it's not terribly different from what we saw in transparency reporting, especially in the earlier days. Uh, where, again, you created a PDF and you put some stuff in it. Um, uh, and I think what's interesting here is, you know, there is this paper written in 2018 by Meg Mitchell and colleagues that called Model Cards that has some specific uh, things. But now what each of the companies do is they sort of pick whatever subset of the questions in her original paper that they, they feel like and fill it out to whatever extent they feel like. Um, and so I think when we say, like... Uh, requiring model cards, I think, to me, that doesn't mean anything. We, sh we should say is we require these specific requirements, and this is the level of uh, precision for each of these requirements, and, and that is a well-specified thing, and then we can decide if that's good enough or not. Um, so that was just one thing I found uh, kind of interesting about uh, the French proposal. But um, uh, I think, more generally, one concern I have is in a lot of the discourse, there is this idea of, of using standard setting, which is like a, a set of processes we have in a variety of jurisdictions, uh, where for those not familiar, you know, there are you know, these sort of standards bodies and say the international level, the ISO, at the uh, say EU level, SEN and SENELEC and, and others. Um, and, and what people maybe don't realize is often these are just sort of exclusively or near exclusively companies, right? So for example, uh, probably most people have not realized, but like uh, recently the ISO came to a standard on AI, standard 42001, uh, which, is, um, which is mostly uh, Microsoft and IBM lobbying for what the, the standard should be. Um, and uh, I think that's fine, and, and that's what you know, the companies should do and how they should express their self-interest. But um, uh, I do worry when we, we think about policy making, and then because we realize policymakers don't have the expertise. We defer to the standard setting, where ultimately the standard setting is letting the companies pick the, own, the exact rules by which they're governed. Um, so I think this is a reason for more 
external parties, not just academics, but others to be involved in the process. And I think the, sec the efficacy of that is, is very uneven across the jurisdictions. But I mean, I think many of us in this room do some of that work. So we have on uh, several questions that have come from the online audience. One that I think builds on this and your response related to standard setting bodies, which is how do you think about the, uh, the NIST framework or the NISC AI risk management framework or any other new AI risk management models, are they incorporated into, um, into your work here? Yeah, I think the NIST AI RMF, which came out in roughly in 2022, is a, is a thoughtful document that is the byproduct of uh, extensive consultation. So I think from a process level, I think it's well done. In terms of the substance of it, what is in that document, which is very long, um, I think much of it is good, but also it's still fairly high level. Um, so I, I'm supportive of what is in the NIST RMF and the process by which it came to be in that RMF, but um, I think ultimately it doesn't resolve many of the hard questions, uh, which it wasn't trying to, but, but that's fine. More recently, uh, the, you know, in the US side, we have an AI Safety Institute housed under NIST. In the UK, they have their companion AI Safety Institute. I think these bodies, it's not clear what they will do or how much they'll achieve, but I think they're interesting new institutional footprint that we have in terms of uh, now there are these specific entities with dedicated staff on AI. Um, and I think the next question is first the organizational one of who will they hire and, and, and what expertise will they have. Uh, but assuming they get that right, and I think the UK is doing a pretty good job of it. I think the US were still early days. Um, uh, then the question is like, what will they actually achieve, right? Because I think, you know, in 2020 and 2018 and 2015, we had the like principles level discussion of like, these are the principles we should use to govern AI. I think in 2024, my view is that the principles are delightful, but we should figure out, you know, some more substantive things. Um, and, and the technology is now actually deployed. So, you know, in 2020, you could have gotten by with principles, but, but you know, now it's widely deployed. So we have some questions about why certain types of transparency or categories that you have up there are important or not. And so one questioner asks about like, why is it so important to know about the labor data? I mean, I can understand maybe from a generic public policy standpoint, but especially if we're focusing on AI risk, what, what, what are you thinking there? Yeah, so I think for me, one of the things is that we have oriented ourselves to think that like, it's sort of the, the back half of your question is like that, we are only concerned about AI risk, and therefore we're only in, interested in all the transparency that leads to it. But to me, th we should be concerned about, you know, a broader set of societal concerns of which the, you know, int risks introduced by AI is just part of it, um, right? And so if there are labor concerns involved with the people, you know, who are producing, uh, you know, the data for RLHF or other things, much like we would have had the same concerns about the people doing content moderation or the people behind crowd working platforms, that's you know something we should know about, even if it has nothing to do with the new risk posed by AI. So let's uh, end with this question of how you evaluate incremental risk. Uh, and this kind of builds on Dave Wilner's question. Um, we, we've had this conversation before, but just for the the benefit of everybody, the you know one of the big questions over the last year is, uh, or issues related to open source models, but even just generative AI uh, in general, is um, the CSAM problem that you identify and, and, and that you put out. Um, and and th that was the one category where you had uh, uh, op you know black dots uh, all across that, that graph, that or that table. Um, how should, the, the, what is the sort of incremental risk approach doing for us here? And by that I mean, like, if your stability and you're deciding whether you're going to to release a model that will allow people to generate all kinds of images, certainly you avert to the risk that some of those things are going to be really awful pictures. All right. So, so given your approach there, how should we think about the either the decision of the company or the kind of regulation that would try to get at those kinds of problems? Yeah, I think, I think this also goes to Dave's original question, too, is I think right now, I think the contribution we're trying to make in this work is really to get us to have grounded conversations about risk. I don't think in any way is a full 
framework for either release decision making or setting thresholds and policy. It doesn't aim to do that, but um, and and so I think it should be clear that it's not good enough to do that to do either of those things for multiple reasons. First of all, it certainly doesn't tell you how you should weigh the benefits versus the risks. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's a much harder question that we all have thought about in in many different ways. But um, the second point is. I think we're trying to identify the marginal risk and be crisp about it because we felt that is a defect in the current discourse. Mm -hmm. Is right now, you know, I think I'm just trying to get the discourse to be more grounded. And then I think to Dave's point, we're going to have different theories about how we address risk and so on. And we're going to need to hash those out and different companies will also implement different things. Um, uh, but right now, I think to me, the irritant for me is that we're just not having grounded conversations. So I'm trying to fix that problem with this, not you know answer the harder questions you're, you're posing. Great. Well, please join me in thanking Rishi Bomasani. <laughs> uh, next week, we've got Chinmay Sharma from uh, Fordham Law School, who will also be talking uh, a bit about AI, but uh, from the law professor's perspective. So please join us then.